for all those of military age, the exodus failed. <clears throat> they died in the wilderness. Because you see, the picture that you have just heard had happened before 40 years earlier. And the people had met at Kadesh Barnea. Now, if you are reading your Bibles, you will see that there is the name of another place where the people had gathered, this time on the west side of the Jordan. And I want you to know that it uh, must be pronounced with an im at the end, not as you would probably pronounce it if you read it in modern American English, because it does look like a word that we tell our children not to use. So it's a very fun word, but the people were living there and waiting to go into Jordan a second time. Kadesh Barnea had been a huge, huge disappointment. If you're a veteran today of a, uh, a serving time in the U.S. military of some kind, I want you to know that uh, I believe the sentiment in the United States today is a whole lot better than it was in the 70s. However, I still believe that many of us uh, would, love, would love to say thank you. And I think that even those who did not feel that they were thanked when they came home should know now that we would like to thank them for putting themselves in harm's way for the American people. We can debate all day as to whether or not the sending of our troops to another country to defend who knows what is a good thing or a bad thing. But if you'd ask an Israelite whether it was a good thing to leave Egypt, at least initially they would have said yes. Until, of course, they got very tired of manna burgers and manicotti and then manna burgers. And oh yes, it was Wednesday, so it was manicotti again and again and again. And they started saying, where is the meat? And God answered, and, and, and he sent an east wind. And, and I don't know if you've read that story, but it, it, to me, the, the visual of that story is just stunning. He sent so many quail that they were three feet deep on the ground. Okay, that's a lot of quail. Now, the people who just couldn't get to Kentucky Fried quick enough uh, didn't fry, and they just literally ripped into the birds, and they got sick. We know it today as salmonella. We don't know if these birds had salmonella, but they got a, an awful lot of people sick. God did these kinds of things on the way because he needed them to know that he was their support. He was their, he was their everything. He was the God who had brought them through the waters. And he had brought them through on dry land. Amen. The beginning of this month, we started with the Exodus. So it's kind of strange for me to be saying today that for an entire generation, the Exodus was a failure. But it was. They lived out their days in the desert. And there they died and their bones bleached in the sun. The very sort of Western movie-ish type look and feel to that idea, but that's what happened. It's interesting, though, that they went through on dry land, and I want to remind us that this is a direct, a direct uh, allusion, if you like, to the days of creation, when God did what? Separated the waters and made dry land. So keep that in your mind as we go forward in the story, because again, the children of Israel are camped 
on the banks of the River Jordan. Twelve spies in the first, in the first go-round had gone into the land of Israel and there was a vote taken at the end about who should report what. And if you remember, there were only two spies who said, we can do this. And of those two spies, one was Joshua and the other was Caleb. And I do know of families who have decided these are two giants of faith and so therefore they have named their two sons Joshua and Caleb. But these are the only two of their generation that make it out of the desert. They have experienced the exodus. In the time of Joshua's life, he has been uh, uh, Moses' attaché, and he has, he has never wavered in his faith. He, he goes over, he gives a report that there are giants in the land, but that with God, all things are possible. Amen. Is exactly what he says when he comes back. Amazingly, and, and, and veterans, you will know this feeling if you have ever felt like what you did made somebody else upset. The rest of the Israelites literally picked up stones and were going to stone Joshua and Caleb for their report. In, if God had not intervened, uh, they, they would have been murdered. The other ten said there are giants in the land. And there is no way that we, you see the, the vast difference here between the reports, comes in that language right there. There, there are giants in the land and there's no, no way that we can take over. No faith, no listening to the promise, no willingness to, to follow God unconditionally, and best of all, for the sermon series, no willingness to allow God to fight for them. To allow God to be their protector and their leader. And so they turned back from Kadesh Barnea and they went into the desert for 40 years. And there, again, those of military age and older, which was about 30 Interesting that it would be 30. Didn't another man start his ministry when he was 30? Uh-huh. So it's an interesting age. Anybody 30 and older died in the wilderness. So we're back again. We're back again in the, in the river valley of Jordan. And the, the people are now a different people because the one generation has passed on. It's 40 years later. And the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 4 that Moses is dead. It, this, this whole thing about Moses dying is very strange to me. I want you to know he's, he dies at 120 years old. It is very interesting that three times four is... You know that one already, don't you, Javen? Three times four is 12. Okay. Three times 40 years, and you can think of it as... Moses living his life in three segments, 40 years in Egypt, learning everything the Egyptians could teach him. Came in real handy when he got to that well, right? And there's Zipporah, and he gets to really impress her with his skills, okay? <laughs> Learned in the Egyptian military school that he went to when he was rivals with the other guy that was being put forward to be Pharaoh, whom he then went back 40 years later and faced. It wasn't as if Moses didn't know the Pharaoh he was talking to. It was the guy that beat him out for the job of Pharaoh of Egypt. All because he thought that he could do what God wanted done by killing that Egyptian. And that the Israelites would rise up and follow him because of the way in which he announced that he was their savior. Instead, it caused him to spend the next 40 years of his life herding sheep and getting to know Zipporah. Not a bad thing. Had a couple of boys we know of. 
But Moses dies on top of Mount Nebo. And if you don't know that story, go to the New Testament because that's my favorite piece about it. Take what you find in Deuteronomy and match it up with what you find in Jude. Don't often get to quote Jude, except if you're a you know, Beatles fan. But um, Jude, Jude has only one chapter. So when I say Jude verse 9... It's because there is only one chapter, and in verse 9 we, we read that, that Moses dies and, and that there is a fight over him. He dies, though, according to Deuteronomy, in perfect health. He's 120 years strong, army strong. He's not ready to die, so how come he dies? I have my theory. You know, if you push me, I'll... I'll tell you my theory, because one time he had asked God to see him face to face, and what did God tell him? If you see me face to face, what will happen to you? You will die. So what do you think happened on the top of Mount Nebo? I think God gave him what he wanted. And he died in the arms of God. And then the devil comes and says, he's mine because he disobeyed you. And God said, no, I've paid the price, he's mine. And Michael and, the, and Satan fight over him and Michael wins. My friends, I want you to know that small verse gives me such courage because of all the things that happened in Moses' life, and that at the end, even though there were things where he had done wrong and had not blessed God with his life, God still claims him and says, he is mine. Now we know that Moses is one of those uh, uh, individuals, you could say, or humans, that is in heaven. Adventist church likes to teach that there, you, know, you, you don't go to heaven when you die. Okay, true. However, we do know by biblical terms that there are some humans in heaven. Just check Matthew chapter... To, uh, 16, I believe. There are a number of people who ascend with Jesus at the time of his ascension who were resurrected with him on the third day. And we know this because people in Jerusalem recognized them. They must have been pretty famous. So you have this, you have this thing about Moses. He's, he's dead after 120 years and he needs a successor. His successor is known as Joshua. Now, for the purposes of today, I think that it would be wise for us to realize this is only slightly different in the Hebrew from the word that we know for Jesus, or the Hebrew word is Yeshua. So there's Yahshua, and then there's Yeshua. Maybe just one little vowel point different in the Hebrew. But you can know that Joshua is a type of Christ, just as a type meaning a, a, a forerunner or a, a person who acted in the same way as Jesus acted. Moses, too, was a, a savior of sorts that brings the people of Israel out of bondage. And then Joshua is handed the task of being the military leader who is now going to lead them into the promised land. That's where we are on the, in the borderlands. With God's help, he says, we can take it. We've looked at the fact that there's the Exodus. We've looked at the fact that uh, if, if you missed it, you can get it on, on TV. Did you know we, we do TV around? Oh. Birker, thank you so much for putting that on TV for us. Uh, women, if you missed Woman's Day, otherwise known as Mom's Day, we said that women were humanity's best friend. Amen, ladies? Amen. All right. And gentlemen, we came back to you with Ruth last week and said that Jesus is like the kinsman redeemer that steps in and redeems us. He's also the firstborn of the dead and our savior. And so we come to 12, 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan River. And this is where we're going to bring this together and you'll find that it really is very, very personal. It's very, very personal. Israelite history may seem ancient, but I think it has been replayed again and again in our own history. From, and when I mean our own, I'm, I'm speaking of the Adventist church. 
So I hope you will bear with me if that's not your uh, tradition. From the Millerite movement that gripped the heart of thousands and spawned a global evangelistic push, we, the children, and I'm, I'm involving myself in that because of my own heritage, the children and the grandchildren of people like James and Ellen White, S.N. Haskell, J.N. Andrews, I'm going to add one of my favorites, E.E. E. Cleveland, come on now. Okay. Squeaky Cleveland, come on, can't do it without him. We have, like our forebears in the Israelite story, been wandering around in the wilderness. Folks have laughed at, at, at us and, and at those who, who prepped. Raise your hand if you know what a prepper is. Okay, some of you know. There were a bunch of preppers in 1844. And they were prepping for Jesus' second coming, and they prepped, for example, by not harvesting their crops. Leaving them in the field until maybe late October, when they started to try and harvest things that maybe couldn't be harvested anymore, because Jesus didn't come back face to face at that time. Folks still laugh and try to dissuade those of us who observe the Sabbath day on Saturday. Several generations now have passed uh, to their rest. Uh, my grandfather, uh, his father, uh, my dad. Uh, my dad got a brain tumor at 53. And um, worst thing for him about dying at that age was that he would not, in his words, would not be alive to see the end, the ending stuff. Because that's so important to Adventists. I think sometimes maybe too important. Would you forgive me for saying that? Maybe you would if I were to explain it. They've passed to their rest, these generations, and now there are those of us who are left and we are waiting. I don't know about you, but I thought it was ironic that not much was made of our 150th anniversary, was it? How many years ago was that? Does anybody know or care? I think at this point, there are those of us who are saying, you know, Yes, the Adventist church has been around over 150 years and we're saying still that Jesus is coming soon. But what does that mean? And I think we need to discuss what that means today because there are those of us who are getting older who maybe in our younger years thought that it would be really cool if we could just walk right into the kingdom of heaven without dying. And that somehow that was better than those who would die and then be resurrected. Let's think about that in the context of what is going on in our world today and what we can say with assurance to our friends and neighbors about living with Jesus Christ today. Because if it doesn't matter about what it is to live with Jesus today, what does it matter that he's coming again real soon? I know that might cause some of you to just have a little moment of angst there, but don't worry, I'm still a very staunch, staunch believer that Jesus is coming back and that it is going to be soon. So while we wait, this is, this is the, the context in some respects of personalizing this, while we wait for Jesus' second appearance in person, face to face, we can decide, I believe, we can decide right here today to cross over and join those who realize that the uh, earth is the Lord's. can't even read my own writing. And that Jesus is the king of the world and that the kingdom is here now and that that started when Jesus died and was resurrected on the cross. Do we believe that he is the king of the world? Is, is, is Jesus your king today? Yes. Okay, so then you don't disagree that he has taken over as king of the world when he rose from the dead. And that when we say yes to him, we are becoming part of his 
kingdom. Is that not right? We can decide, you see, mentally. We can decide socially. We can decide emotionally to cross over. And when, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, when you ask for membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and you understand what we understand about Scripture and you ask in some respects to cross over, what are you asking for? If not, to join the kingdom of heaven and to walk with a people who have dedicated themselves for nigh over 150 years to proclaiming that the same God that resurrected from the dead on the third day is the same God who is coming back to get us. You can cross over and you can believe that and you can become part of the citizenry of the kingdom of heaven today. That is available, my friends, and that, I believe, is the best news humanity could ever hear. That it can happen today, that it can be now, and that if you die, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, is it, like I said, is it only at funerals that we get this kind of a talk? Oh, we don't want you to grieve, Paul says, like other people? Well, I'm telling you right now. I want you to have joy. I want you to know the joy of being unshackled from fear. Because it is that fear of dying and separation that drives so much of what we do that hurts God. Because we have not crossed over. Because we have not decided to be in his kingdom. Now we may be Seventh-day Adventists. But are we following his lead? Are we trusting him to be our leader? Okay, let's, let's, let's come back. Let's, let's come back. <laughs> They're at the Jordan. The situation has a few parts to it, and it was referred to earlier today. They consecrated themselves, my friends. They decided there was nothing that could exist in their camp that, that was going to separate them from their allegiance to God. And I want you to know, as I searched my own heart, thinking about that this week, I realize that there are things that I may be doing, thinking, saying that are not helpful to God's kingdom. And that's the reference point. You see, we are born for God's glory. We're born to be his servants. We're born to be in his kingdom. And the fact is, if I accept that invitation that he has given to all humanity, and I decide to be a citizen of his kingdom, and I believe that I am a card-carrying Christian, and, 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 and you know, denominationally I'm a card-carrying Seventh-day Adventist, then he has to look like my leader. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite. And as I talked with at least one person this week, I will say to you what I said to them, and that is that as Christians, we earn that. <laughs> it's not fake. We, we earn that, that name. I'm sorry. We earn the name hypocrite when we say one thing and do another. They decided they had to consecrate themselves. They had to put it all away. They had to be 100% in with God. Then they prepared, they, they cleaned themselves. There was three days. They, they divested themselves of everything that they would not need anymore because they were no longer going to be on the other side of the Jordan. They were entering into the land of promise. They were entering into Canaan. 
And then the fourth thing that they had to do was to move. Now the military teaches you, move or die. No witness? Nobody from military school going to say amen to that? Move or die. You stay stationary, they find your position, they will kill you. We're on the banks of the Jordan, my friends. I think generationally, the Adventist church is back there again. Don't believe me? I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. My granddaddy and my daddy died hoping that they would see Jesus come. They are resting, waiting for him to come and resurrect them. And it is left to us. It is left to us to keep on giving the good news to the world that Jesus is coming soon. That's what it means to be a person focused on the second appearing, the advent of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, the best news is, if you get resurrected at my second advent, that's good. Because if you get resurrected at my third coming, that will be so that you can bow the knee and realize that you should have chosen differently. Can you testify today that God has come into your life and has, has parted the waters for you? Because that's, that's where we are today. The priests, the priests of God carrying the ark of God, which Ellen calls a token of God's presence, a symbol of his presence in the midst of his people. They walk, and as they walk barefooted into the water, that is flowing, the Bible says, at flood stage. These are the spring floods, just about this time in the year. If you're living in Reno, Nevada, where I came from just a few months ago, they are dealing weekly, monthly, with flooding. Come on, Californians, say amen. There was so much, there was so much snow in the Sierras this year that there is no drought. At least where we live now, go down to San Diego, they might tell you different, but that snow that packed up and up and up and up in the Sierras is now draining off of both sides going into California and going into Nevada where there isn't many rivers. It just goes into a big lake and stays there. But they have to watch out for flooding. It's the springtime. The snow is melting. Guess what? Mount Hermon in Lebanon, still to this day, has snow on it, and the Israelite nation depends on it. They only have one river, it's the River Jordan. They only have one lake, it's Lake Galilee. And if it doesn't get the snows of Mount Hermon coming off in the springtime, they are in deep weeds. Only source of fresh water. Why do you think the Israelis are at the head of the line when it comes to desalination technology? Because they have a coastline, but it's salt water. And when the Jordan does dry up someday, they want to be able to have a source of fresh water that they can drink. That's today. But it's always been that in the spring, this is now a tiny trickle. When you, when you go to Israel, and I hope you all have the chance to someday, go, if you want to go to Jordan, go look at the river. <laughs> and don't, don't laugh like I did. Well, maybe you will. It's a creek. The mighty, the mighty, mighty River Jordan. The, you know, what are we saying? The Jordan River is chilly and cold? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it is snow runoff. So yes, in certain parts of the Jordan, it is chilly and cold. But it is mostly along the banks now, a creek that's not even, not even this wide. You took a flying leap, and I bet Matthew could jump right over it. Go from Israel into Jordan, the state of Jordan. But at the time of the spring floods, it is a raging, roiling torrent. And I'm going to say that in our world today, we are faced with the same kinds of obstacles. They're not just little. They're huge. 
We're having to deal with things today that I'm actually happy for my father that he didn't have to deal with. He was a youth man through and through and served this denomination very well in that capacity. But I'll tell you what, I never saw my dad work so hard as when his portfolio changed from being world pathfinder leader to being youth leader. Upper ages. Never saw my dad bring work home from the office until that time. Because he had to catch up. He had to find out what was ticking. And I believe that he would, if he was still alive in his retirement, he would still be having to run like all the rest of us to keep up with you youngins. Because it is amazing how fast culture is changing and what people think is normal now that just wasn't even thought of even 20 years ago. Generation that walked out of Egypt is dead. My father is dead. But we are alive. And I believe we're back. We're back there again. We have the opportunity to listen to God and to take him up on his, his dastardly plan. His impossible plan. Walk into those waters. Walk on in. Walk on into those waters. Follow the priests. Follow the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. Keep, God is going to keep His promise. And that promise is in, in, in that box. In, enshrined in the law that He gives, which is His character. He, he, he does not make promises that He cannot keep. And so He sends that box of promise, that's covenant, promise, he sends that box into the middle of the river. As soon as the Bible says, as soon as the priest's feet touch the waters, the downstream current is peeled back. The rest of the water that is now on their left is going on downstream. But Ellen says, he piled up the waters. Man, I want to be in a place like that. I want to be where I get to see the, the omnipotence, the, the grandeur of God, don't you? And I believe that that happens when we see someone's life changed. Because I believe today that I cannot even change my own life. I can't change your life, and you can't change anybody else. There is only one power on earth that has that kind of change agent in it. And that is, my friend, the power of God. He piles up the waters. The rest go downstream. And the priests walk out into the middle of what used to be a roiling stream, a roiling river. I'm sure it's oozing a little bit with mud at that moment. And as Joshua then tells the people to go forward, they all pass by. Ellen reminds us that there had been about a half mile gap between the covenant, between, the, between the, where the ark was and where the people were. This was respect. Respect for God. But the people pass by. They pass by and they see those priests holding that ark. And then as, as, as they are finished going through the 12 designated men that you read, that you heard about being read in Joshua chapter 4, the, the 12 designated men go back into the middle of the river. The ground zero, if you like, the middle of the place where God's power has been demonstrated, where the water is still being piled up. Because it's not stopped coming down, it is just piling up. And there they are told, Choose a big, smooth stone. Now, I like skipping stones just like the next person. And yes, smooth ones skip better. We're told that they were told to pick a big stone from the middle so that when they put it all together, it would be a reminder, the Bible says, that it would be a reminder of what just happened. So they set the stones 
in, appear, in place on the other side of the Jordan until the people move to Gilgal. And then those stones are then moved to Gilgal as a place where God, again, sanctifies his people. Interesting, uh, and, and this is for those who are a little older, interesting methodology that God uses to reconnect his people to himself. The sign in the body is circumcision. The sign for everyone is the Passover. And here we are reminded that when the people turned back, when they were at Kadesh Barnea the first time and they were turned back, circumcision ceased. And so did the Passover. So for 40 years, they were in this disjointed relationship with their God. That is why they call the place Gilgal, which sounds like the Hebrew for rolling away, because God says, at this time, I have rolled away your guilt. I have rolled away this thing that has been between us. My friends, I don't know about you, but I, I want to be part of that group. I want to be part of that group that, that has whatever is between me and God. I want Him. He's the only one who can do it. I want Him to roll it away. And I want my life in, in, in my body and, and, and in my spirit and in my relationships, I want my life to represent. To represent. I believe we can trust Him. I believe that those 12 stones stand as a monument at that moment. So what do you think the monument is today? Well, I have, a, I have an idea. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm going to put forward this idea, you do with it as you please. But I believe today that the Sabbath is a reminder of the God of creation. The God who separated the waters and caused dry land to be the place where he would have us live. The God who did that for the first generation Israelites and part of the Red Sea. The God who did that for the second generation Israelites who came back to take possession of the land of Canaan and parted the Jordan River in flood stage. And they passed through, the Bible says, on dry land. Dry land. This is your home land. This is your home. This is where you will live. This is where you will prosper. How do we remember him? I believe it's wrapped up in the Sabbath day. Which, by the way, I don't think you can break it. How do you break a gift? Let's... Let's dig into that, please. Maybe we will on another Sabbath talk about that. But Sabbath is so much bigger than the clock. Sabbath is so much bigger than you have to wear this or do that. It's way bigger than that. And my friends, if, if we just keep it to that, I fear for us that we will have missed the main significance. And right now I'm going to tell you that to me, the main significance has to do with the fact that it is a commemoration, it is a monument to the God of creation, which the first angel's message says what? Fear God. Which God? The God who made heaven and earth. It, my friends, is a direct reference to the same, same thing. And if we feel called at all, if you feel called at all today to join with those individuals who are saying, we want to be 
part of God's kingdom in the here and now, and we want to be helping our brothers and sisters, our family members, our society to be prepared for that soon coming second appearance of Jesus, then we need to know him. And knowing him means that we know that he is the creator God. Now, I'm happy to tell you that you can even say this to Native Canadians or Native Americans or anybody else on the face of the earth because there are ancient traditions that our denomination has a very specific way of connecting with and it's not the name of Jesus. It's not the name of Yeshua. It is the name of the Creator God. Sialtsiem is his name in the Hachamenim language of northern Vancouver Island, where my best friend has just left pastoring off. The great spirit. How did these people know? My friend is fourth generation from Chief Seattle himself. And when the white man came, Seattle asked the great spirit about them. And he was told by the creator to be friends with them. So you can imagine that generations later, what we see has happened in North America, including Canada, is abysmal when it comes to how Christians have interacted with native peoples. I, 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 I cringe. I cringe. So, we can grab a hold today, we can grab a hold today of this concept that we are servants of the Most High God, we are, we are people of the modern Israel, not by birth, but by choice that we accept the gift that he has given us, that he invites us into his family, and then he gives us a very specific command in one word, my friends, go. Go to all nations, he says. Go to them and tell them that they're all part of my family that has been estranged from me because they have been told bad things about me. And they're choosing not to want to live with me. And they're in fear because they know that to be separated from me means ultimate separation. That's, that's the joy. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to leave it there for today because the, the, the fact is that, that there's a lot to chew on over lunch. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that you prayerfully prayerfully decide whether or not what what you have had in your past as your relationship with Jesus is part of what it means to be back at the River Jordan and whether or not it is that you would like to cross over today has been another opportunity to come to those 12 stones. And believe me, there are many wonderful people who have represented and they have picked up a stone in the middle of Jordan and they have brought it and they have said to their families, this is the God who saved us. This is the God who we want to worship forever and ever. And I say, parents, listen to Joshua today. Tell your children Children, tell your friends, grandmas and grandpas, tell your people. Jesus is coming again, and we want to be part of his people living in his land now because Jesus is the king of this land now. And he will see us face to face. He will give us, just like Moses, he will give us the desires of our heart. Psalm 37 that we heard today. He will give us the desires of our heart and we will see him face to face. But until that day, we can live as part of his kingdom now.
you want to accept that, if you want to go with that, I just ask you to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I accept your offer. I want to cross over. I want to be part of your people. I want to go into the land of Canaan. God in heaven, thank you so much. Amen.